Welcome to another episode of Coffee with Kareem. I am your host, Kareem Sirajuddin. I've been wanting to talk about gender and sex and a lot of the recent constructs that have been developing in our society. And I just wanted to share some reflections that have come up for me as a human scientist, as someone who has studied psychology and works has worked with a variety of people you know, over the years. Um, and I just find it very interesting, uh, this current phenomena and how specifically you know, certain communities are dealing with this. So it really finally made me go, all right, it's time to talk about this. Uh, I saw in my news feed an article from The Independent, Martina Navratilova. She was considered by Tennis Magazine in 2005 as the greatest female tennis player for the years of 1975 through 2005. And she's considered one of the best, if not the best, female tennis players of all time. And she says that transgender women are cheating if they compete in women's sports. And I was like, oh, this is an interesting title. So I read through and it really kind of brings up a lot of the controversy. So I just want to quickly go through this article as kind of the context or the basis of uh, the reflections that I'd like to share. So Martina claims that allowing transgender women to compete in professional uh, tennis is insane and cheating, quote, insane and cheating. The legendary tennis player Martina, who came out as a lesbian in 1981, said competing against trans women who still had biologically male bodies made a mockery of women's sport. Quote, she said, I am happy to address a transgender woman in whatever form she prefers, but I would not be happy to compete against her. It would not be fair. End quote. She continues to say, quote, To put the argument at its most basic, a man can decide to be female, take hormones if required by whatever sporting organization is concerned, win everything in sight, and perhaps earn a small fortune, and then reverse his decision to go back to making babies if he so desires. It's insane and it's cheating. End quote. The article continues to say, even trans athletes who take steps to lower their hormone levels still benefit from years of development in muscle and bone density since childhood as a man, she said. Martina, who won 18 grand slam titles in a 30-year career at the top of the sport, also criticized the, quote, tyranny and, quote, bullying she had received from trans activists since she started publicly raising her concerns last year. She particularly singled out the Canadian trans cyclist Rachel McKinnon, who won the women's 35-44 to sprint at the Track Cycling World Championship last year, six years after she transitioned from being a man aged 29. McKinnon has vigorously defended her right to compete, pointing out that when tested, her levels of testosterone, the male hormone, were well within the limits set by the world cycling governing body. Nevertheless, at six feet tall and weighing more than the average woman, she appeared to have substantial advantage in muscle mass over her rivals. McKinnon began an onslaught of aggressive tweets after she expressed skepticism about women with penises competing against natal women, the tennis star wrote. She accused me of being transphobic. So this is Martina, the uh, player who's coming out and talking about the whole industry and, and transgender Uh, and how it's been impacting it. So she came out and said that she was called um, or accused of being transphobic and was demanded to delete her tweets and apologize. So Martina, quote, said, I also deplore what seems to be a growing tendency amongst transgender activists to denounce anyone who argues against them and to label them all as transphobes. That's just another form of tyranny. However, Martina made a distinction between those who choose to transition and those born with some kind of intersex condition, such as the South African runner and Olympic 800-meter champion Castor Semina, and last year the International Association of Athletics Federations, IAAF, introduced a rule which required female athletes with naturally high testosterone levels to take hormone therapy to lower them. Semina is challenging the decision at the court for arbitration 
And Martina said she, as someone who had experienced social stigma for her identity, hoped that South Africa would win. Samina and many others have been subject to vilification, ostracism, and the awful human inclination to identify who is different and start a witch hunt, she wrote. I had problems of that, that kind myself, and when I came out as gay in 1981, it hurt terribly. Rights group Trans Actual tweeted, quote, We're pretty devastated to discover that Martina is transphobic. If trans women had an advantage in sport, why aren't trans women winning gold medals left, right, and center? Well, maybe because it's just starting here. A spokesperson for the Stonewall charity said, quote, sport should be welcoming to everyone, including trans people. We need clubs and governing bodies as the experts to consider how their sports individual policies can work to be as inclusive as possible and what advice and guidance they're giving to ensure all people, including trans people, can take part in sport. All right, so that's uh, the end of the article, and um, I think it's just important for me to have read that so everyone has a little bit of a context. And it's also very interesting because it, it brings in here now the idea of, is this um, phenomena going to really impact um, private as well as public policies, standards, um, and so forth? So, of course, right now we're already seeing, you know, policies for using pronouns for people or, you know, anybody can be um, impacted with the policies in this movement. So for instance, in universities now, there's a big dilemma um, between students, professors, and uh, as far as can I lose my job if I don't call somebody a pronoun that they want to identify with, um, or do we stick with the biological terms? Uh, how does this impact other spheres? Well, of course, uh, education. You know, from a young age, there are now being uh, policies put where children can decide their gender, can undergo surgery. Um, of course, public schools are now getting a lot more LGBTQ um, affirmation and education and awareness. Uh, you know, and of course, to reduce bullying and, and these types of things is, is important. Um, take another example, something like the medical industry. You know, if I'm a doctor and I come to see a patient and they're describing extreme, you know, pains in their, you know, navel area, um, and the first thing a doctor might assume based on symptoms, oh, this might have to do with menstrual cycles. And then you walk in and uh, even though it says on their chart they, they're a woman, it uh, turns out they're biologically a male. So now it's a whole other diagnosis or a whole other approach. Um, you know, legal policies. I mean, there's just so many things, guys, that's going to get impacted if this phenomena or this movement becomes public policy and the cultural impact is going to, of course, change everybody's perceptions and lives about things. Let's just start with this first category, right? The first category that, you know, gender fluidity uh, argument makes is that gender is not pegged in biology. Biology has nothing to do with gender. Um, your sex is something and your gender is something you can choose. So sex is determined by your genetics and gender is something you determine um, by your choice or identity. So let's work with this notion here. I still feel strongly that this is a categorical error and that biology is not completely separate from gender. Now, before anyone starts to get, you know, uh, ideas here, one thing you should know about me is, you know, when you compare me to, let's say, the very conservative, traditional religious person, I see myself as a lot more liberal or open-minded because I know things aren't completely black and white in life and certainly in human populations. But I do uh, recognize that statistical probability, any central data point of hu the human experience will have what is known in statistics as a bell curve. So for instance, if we take the average age that men and women die, there is an average age there. It's between, you know, let's say 65 and 75. Um, and when you see the average age of a male or female separately, and when they die, there is a bell curve. Yes, there are, of course, exceptions that make that rule. And this is important. It's not exceptions of the rule. It's exceptions that make the rule because any rule is based on the majority. Right. So, for instance, in Islam, you can have people who drink alcohol um, and they can be very reasonable with their drinking, like one glass of wine a day or a beer a day um, or two or three because they're seven feet tall and they won't get drunk or lose, you know, judgment, let's say. Right. Yes, of course, there are cases like that. 
but that doesn't mean that most people aren't going to be intoxicated and likely do things outside of their clear judgment. That's why alcohol is forbidden for everybody across the board. Um, we don't allow the rule to be uh, exist to drink alcohol just because there's exceptions that make that rule. Another example, there are 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, even 12-year-olds that are tall enough and smart enough to drive a car. But we're not going to change the law that you have to be at least 16 and, you know, take a series of tests and practice before you can have a license and go on the road. So just because there's a 12 or 14 or 15 year old that is sound enough to drive, we don't change the rule or the law that, okay, now let's make the driving age 12 or 10 even, okay? So we have to remember this idea of bell curve and that statistically, approximately, usually about 70% of people fall in the middle and then you have the ends of the curve start to get smaller in percentage all the way out into what's called a standard deviation or very small percentage that represents this population. So when we're talking about biology and gender, uh, gender energy, let's call it, so masculine and feminine energy, most men are going to exhibit what is considered generally masculine and women the same. Of course, you're going to have um, exceptions where you have, let's say, men that are extremely masculine in their traits and have a very difficult time relating to their feminine side or the feminine altogether. And you also will have males that are, let's say, way more feminine in their disposition and energy um, than the general bell curve. I, I totally accept that. I, I know that this is true. There is a variety of traits that exist in biological males and females. And I don't really have a problem with that because I think that's great. That's part of the diversity and the complementariness of the range of men and women that are out there. And how that usually works in my observation is, you know, if you take a you know simple sample of like a man who's, let's say, considered 90 masculine and 10 feminine, they will usually find more compatibility or complementariness with a woman who has the opposite energy distribution. Right. So, for instance, a woman who is uh, 90 feminine and, and 10 masculine, right, they'll complement each other. And you can have the same with, let's say, 60 masculine and 40 feminine. That would complement very nicely with, um, you know, a woman who is 60 feminine and 40 masculine. So I don't see a problem with having a range of gender traits or a range of ma masculine and feminine qualities that can be embedded in the male and female. But again, the only reason why we understand that distribution or variation is based on the middle. And Islam always teaches us that the truth is always closest to the middle. We are a community of the middle. And always follow the middle way um, is a common principle in many uh, world religions and even science, right? Most things fall under a range, a, a center uh, of value points um, versus the extreme right and the extreme left of a bell curve, okay? So if you kind of hold that for a second as we get into this, all right? So biology, in my opinion, are basically these fundamental pegs which now allow us to generate this variation of qualities and traits that we can clearly observe in people, even within our own families sometimes, right? Uh, now, what's happening today is biology has nothing to do with it for the most part. And here's where I think it, it requires, I think, more deeper reflections. So, if there is gender fluidity, okay, um, which, again, I don't have a problem with that as long as you're working within the uh, bell curve range that is commonly understood by objective science and observable throughout societies, you do have, of course, cultural customs that play a role in what is considered masculine and feminine. There isn't just one version of that, right? So in the United States, you have a range of those traits and what they imply. You have that in India, you have that in Egypt, you have that in South Africa. It's going to be different uh, to a degree, but also there's going to be a lot of similarity and commonality. So there is, so just to summarize, um, the position I'm coming from is gender is, has fluidity within the bell curve structures that is represented or springs out of the pegs of male and female biology or sex. 
And yes, gender, um, masculine and feminine qualities can have some variation based on cultural customs and perceptions, right? So if in a culture, a man who wears three earrings means he's a man, then part of your masculinity there would be to have three earrings, even though that would be considered feminine in other societies, right? So I am totally open to this idea that culture plays a role in, in masculine and feminine energy, but that masculine and feminine energy is ultimately still pegged in biological realities, and that cannot be dismissed. So bringing it back to the article here with Martina, you know, her claim is like, look, let's get real here. This isn't really about just, you know, personal subjective identity. Um, this has actual implications, you know, with people's biological bodies and capacities. And men and women clearly have different capacities with biology, right? It doesn't mean that we can't do the same things, even though there are some things we simply can't do. But the reality is, is if you take a woman who has trained and lifted weights and never taken any testosterone and naturally just became a strong, awesome fighter and put her in a match against a man who had the same level of training without any hormonal, you know, no testosterone boosts or, um, you know, steroids or anything like that, like 90% of the time, the man's still going to beat the woman in a UFC fight, right? Because if that wasn't true, then why aren't we also mixing men and women in professional sports or professional fighting, because clearly there's some disadvantage there, despite our gender identity, as Martina is claiming in the article. A couple of um, other reasons why gender identity or gender identity dysphoria, as it's been termed, or, you know, transgenderism, which is essentially this notion that the gender that I identify with is contrary or in opposition to my biological makeup and structure, okay? And what's interesting is when it comes to any other major subjective claim that has no objective reality or evidence, like I identify as an airplane or a tiger or as an 85-year-old man, um, or let's say bodily dysphoria, right? So for instance, there are people who are anorexic or bulimic and they believe they are fat, even though objectively speaking, they are, you know, skin and bones. Um, we would treat that very differently than affirming and, you know, making everyone else feel guilty if they don't accept that this person uh, isn't anorexic and they are fleshy and look beautiful no matter what, right? I mean, when it comes to all these other symptoms or cases uh, in the field of psychiatry and psychology, there is a lot more scientific examination, weight, process, and data that we have to consider. Uh, another example could be a person who has what they call phantom limb dysphoria, right? Like I could be a man who has two arms, but I identify as if I only have one arm. There's people that actually feel this way. Like I feel like my right arm isn't even there. It doesn't exist. Uh, so do we say, okay, let's go cut off your arm or your legs because your strong subjective claim and experience is the following. Do we just start doing that now? So this whole point is because now you can take an eight-year-old or a two-year-old or a 12-year-old and we will go ahead and provide means for surgery, hormone uptake, and clear biological and physiological changes for this individual to feel more like what they are claiming that they feel. Okay, so this brings up a question. If gender isn't rooted in biology or has nothing in biology, why are we changing our biology when we are trying to flow from one gender to another? I mean, have we thought about that? And if there is no biological basis for gender, then what exactly are we flowing back and forth from, right? There, there's still an idea of a masculine and feminine, male and female. These two pegs is what we're working with in this bell curve, right? So if that's not true, then... What am I flowing from? How am I identifying not as a man if there's no gender for me to actually identify with outside of my own? If it's all just social construct. You get my point. So, of course, it's rooted in biology. The very fact that I identify as a woman now means I'm going to go take estrogen or do surgeries to remove my penis or to increase an estrogen or, you know, whatever and decrease testosterone to diminish, you know, muscle mass, hair, 
I am clearly identifying that there are traits and qualities, biological, that are associated with male and female. Let's take it further. People who don't do any surgeries, but they just start dressing like a male or a woman, the opposite of their actual biological gender. This also suggests that they are identifying feminine qualities that are socially constructed, right? Because I, when I was in grad school, I knew a guy who in my class who was a male at the beginning of the year, and by the end of the year, he was not. He started to dress as a woman and wear makeup and lipstick and wear short skirts, and he had nice, muscular, hairy legs. And my point here is that, you know, the person is identifying with what is considered typically or stereotypically, all right, even let's say that, stereotypically, female. So therefore, there must be a sense that we all recognize as a species that is uh, gender is rooted in biology, all right? My second question is this, how can I ever fully know what it's like to be a woman if I'm a man or a man if I'm a woman? Because Let's, I'm a man, I identify as a man right now, and I think I am more of a woman, or I've been feeling like I am a woman, over-identification as a woman, or I never associated myself as being a, a male. Let's just say that's, that's the case. How do I really know what the other side actually feels like? Because this is a problem with consciousness now, just like we can never know what it's really like to be a bat or a dolphin or even another human being. Right? I don't really know exactly the quality, the qualitative state of what it's like to be John or Mary or Ahmed or anybody else. I'm only relating to my own subjective experience. So how can I ever know what it's like to be a woman if I've never had menstrual cycles or breasts or milk being produced in my breasts? I've never given birth to a child if, let's say, a person has done that. Um, how could you know what it's like to be a man if you've never had testes or produced sperm or experienced an orgasm as a male does or as a female does? And so on and so forth, right? So what exactly are we identifying with if we have no substantial or absolute evidence of what it's fully like to be the other? Therefore, we're actually relating to a social construct of gender, feminine gender or masculine uh, gender based on society. So that means that we're still using the social constructs to identify ourselves with. But I thought the whole argument was gender is a choice and it's not rooted in biology and it's all a construct that's been shoved down our throats for hundreds of years and now we're finally seeing the light. But the whole thing, I feel like, contradicts itself, right? Because you can't uh, actually make those claims, but then everything you're doing shows that you actually accept those claims. That gender is rooted or at least associated or born out of basic biological qualities and traits and biochemistry. That's what makes men men and women women. We can't just ignore the clear and substantiated differences that human, society, human species has acknowledged and work through for a long time, right? Now, this doesn't mean that we have to all be a specific way or, you know, I'm not open to, uh, you know, people getting more rights or, you know, reducing harm in society. But I think it's just as dangerous to superimpose on the public notions that, in my opinion, don't even actually remain consistent logically, scientifically, and even through the very claims that are made by this LGBTQ worldview. Now, it's, it's important to note that there is a difference between equal opportunity for all, despite religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, which I'm totally for. Uh, and the point of that is, of course, you know, the more opportunities we have um, as a people, the more we can access and diversify innovation and talent and gifts and intelligence that we all happen to carry because we all have a distribution of talents, right? So that's good for us as a, as a nation and as a collective that, you know, the more smart people have access to doing what they know how to do best or want to do, the more things you and I can benefit and uh, mutually uh, prosper with, right? I'm totally for that. But the issue is when now we're trying to fulfill this pie in the sky of equal, not only equal opportunity, but equality of all outcomes, right? This kind of utopian society where 
every job, every profession, every sport, every activity is now going to be under the gun to ensure that every single category that any human being identifies with is represented in the workplace or the sport or the activity, right? So that means in a utopian equal outcome society, 50% of men and women will be represented in every career or sport. Um, and then the percentages of, let's say, immigrants or you know homosexuals or transgender people, which are a much smaller percentage compared to the average you know, population stats of, let's say, the United States, they'll also have a fair representation um, in the in the relative percentages that they represent in the population. So if it's like 12% are Indian in America, then we also want to see 12% Indian people working in um, all kinds of sectors and sports uh, just as much, right? But the issue with that whole philosophy or approach is, you know, which categories are we going to use to identify human beings with, right? It, at first it was gender, now it's going to be um, homosexuality or heterosexuality. Now it's going to be, uh, you know, not just male and female gender, but the whole transgender, transsexual, you know, gender fluid, um, all of these new constructs that are emerging and whatever else will come as a result. Uh, and then what, what are the next categories? That's a, that's a difficult thing. So a simple example. Uh, in November 8th, 2018, um, you, there was an article about a Dutch man who is 69 years old, and he brought up a lawsuit to lower his age by 20 years. All right, you can find this on the BBC, and I'll, I'll have you know articles and references linked in the description of the show. But this gentleman basically said, "Look, I'm 69, and I want to be 49 because I feel like my age is a type of discrimination. It's hard for me to date women. It's hard for me to get a job. It's hard. I don't feel as young, and you know." vigilant as I would if I really, you know, felt like I was 49. So he wanted legal change uh, of all his legal documents for this purpose. So that's like a current lawsuit, right? So it just goes to show that, you know, okay, what categories of discrimination or subjectivity or identity are we willing to accommodate here, right? Because now it's now it's an age thing. Where Where are the boundaries? And if science and, you know, common sense, rationalism, objective truth is something that is not really going to be heavily weighed, then who knows, you know, what's going to be next and, and what's going to come after this, right? And I mean, let's just predict here. It's very possible that in the next 10, 15 years, there's going to be more of a normalization for incest, for pedophilia. In fact, I just saw this a couple of weeks ago. I was watching a show and there was a, a pedophile as a character who ended up committing suicide. Uh, and the whole message of this particular show was he is, you know, he has no choice about this. Like he's just, this is the way he is. And he's basically locked into this mentality of being a pedophile. That's his subjective experience. Um, and he can't change it. And, you know, by the end of the show, he kills himself. And everyone's, you know, the whole thing is like, you're supposed to feel really, really bad for him. And of course, that's a sad thing when anyone takes their own life, right? But I didn't feel like it was a three-dimensional or just process. It was simply, you know, he wants this. He knows it's he, he can't have it. He can't control it. And so the result was just kill yourself. So the message I got was that is we have to learn to accept pedophiles and have empathy for them so that they don't kill themselves or be killed by others or whatever it is. And why aren't we exploring that deeper? You know, what's the neurology behind that? Um, and I know that some people, you know, with transgender, there's, you know, very, very recent early re uh, research to try to suggest that there's things in the brain that make a person feel transgender or not, right? But again, this is just like very recent stuff. We haven't, we don't have enough literature to make final conclusions or strong likelihood cases let alone start changing public policies and social perceptions about everything we've known to be pretty standard about man and woman, right? That's the issue I have here. I don't have an issue with the science or looking into it or trying to find like, oh yeah, there could be neurological, hormonal uh, explanations. There could be tra traumas that people go through for why they feel, you know, transgender or homosexual or pedophilia or whatever it is, right? My point is, is we have to untangle the layers 
more sincerely and deeply and not just kind of go gun ho uh, everything has to be accepted and not questioned and if you do you know you're going to be villainized like i find that to be very 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 concerning the other argument that i often hear is well this has been around in history right homosexuality has been around in history transgenderism has been around in history pedophilia has been around in history and what so what you know, rape has been in history, all human history. Murder has been in human history. Um, cheating has been in human history. Uh, corruption in politics and power has been in human history. So what? You know, is that a proof that it's okay just because it's always existed? No, it could also just be a proof that it's always been an evil or um, a, a point of decadence or deviation that has existed. That's not necessarily an argument to say, well, then we should allow people to kill each other whenever they want because murder has always existed in human history. That's not, to me, a sound argument either. Um, because it wasn't okay for the longest time, <laughs> right? What about that point, right? It's Even though it has existed, pedophilia was not necessarily um, a uh, acceptable or normative practice cross-culturally. And slavery was cross-culturally accepted for a long time but that didn't mean that we just decided well it's just been around for so long right especially in, a, in the united states that we just you know somehow work through that and, and find ways to justify it like of course there's times where we're like no this has to stop and we have to change things and i think that this principle has to remain you know and it's not just about what we feel we also have to look at the facts which brings me to another I think important point here around this uh, topic is the most recent uh, studies done in the Scandinavian countries. And for those of you that aren't familiar, it's called the you know Scandinavian uh, gender paradox study. So nations in social sciences and behavioral sciences, political sciences have rankings around different things, right? Like you know economy, um, workforce, literacy, etc. And there's also rankings for countries based on gender equality and gender opportunities. So based on the position that gender opportunities uh, are, of course, influenced by cultural customs and policies and opportunities, um, if we have a society that neutralizes policies, laws, and opportunities so that both genders can have true equal access and not just equal access, because I think we already have that to, to a strong degree in the United States and, and Canada, etc. But the point here is that we as a culture push for girls to go into things that are non-traditionally um, fulfilled by females like STEM research or engineering or construction working or mines or trash, you know, people who collect trash, etc. Then we will have a increase in this distribution of careers, right? If the culture is saying, look, if you're a man or a woman, you are totally encouraged to do whatever it is that you want right? Give your gift, find your talent in any way, shape, or form that you want. There's no, you know, stigma here about these careers are more for men or more for women. Everyone gets to do whatever they want, right? Then based on this, we should see a greater distribution of genders and not have, you know, this skew. Meaning that there are certain careers that most men will continue to occupy and most females will continue to occupy. This suggests that, no, we're, we should see um, more variation of gender in non, you know, female-based careers and vice versa. Um, and I'll also link an article from the Boston Globe, which um, shows us some data about this as well. Um, it's uh, It was published March 7th, 2017, and it basically shows you the percentages of men and women in each profession. So just to give you a quick, you know, snapshot of that. So the professions that have 95% or more in females, I'm just going to give you three examples. There's like a lot listed here, but for example, 97.5% of all preschool and kindergarten teachers are women, as well as speech language pathologists, as well as dental hygienists. And then you start getting into mid to low 90s, things like childcare workers, nurse practitioners, medical assistants, hairdressers, etc. 
right? Then, of course, there's things that are majority women, but you still have a good quarter percent or even third males. So, for instance, about 74% are females working in human resources um, or uh, working as cashiers or in education, training and library occupations, counselors. About 73 to 75% of all these are women and the rest is males. Okay, so you see distributions there. Then you start getting into categories where it's, you know, closer to 50-50. So you have different legal occupations, management, professional related occupations, um, budget analysis, computer operators, sales, news analysts, reporters, correspondents, bus drivers. These are all things that are about 50-50. Arts, design, entertainment, sports, right? You have that more equalized uh, distribution. And then professions that are, you know, high 90s male are things like firefighters, auto, automobile uh, repair, body shops, you know, mechanics, um, highway maintenance dudes, you know, construction and uh, extraction occupations, electricians, sheet metal workers, you know, mining, carpenters. These are all things that are 90, you know, high 90s of males fulfilling these occupations. All right. So the whole gender paradox study was trying to show that if we just equalize all the opportunity politically, policy wise, we make it very easy for everyone. And culturally, we, st we also try to make sure there's no stigma there. We should see a lot more female construction workers and a lot more male kindergarten teachers. Right. That was the theory. But what they actually found was that um, the gap remained the same, if not grew a little bit more. In other words, more men went into more masculine related uh, careers and the opposite was also true. So it begs the question, OK, so why did that happen? Um, is it because naturally when there's no stigma and all opportunities are there, people are going to be generally more inclined to their biological temperaments? Or is it still because of this social construction and uh, conditioning? So one author uh, named Nima Sandaji. So he's making the argument that Nordic welfare states are trying to empower women, yet they're unintentionally holding them back. And, and here's my understanding of why that is. The reason why this is happening, in other words, that more women didn't go into stem cell research or engineering and, and men, you know, went more into female occupations, is because Nor these Scandinavian countries has, have very family friendly policies. In other words, their welfare systems are specially designed to accommodate working mothers, okay? So that moms can still have the liberty to be moms and not necessarily sacrifice their careers or have the choice to not work at all. This is, of course, highly prized for the mother or the working mother in these countries because the policies um, really pay family leave better than most places. Right? There's tax subsidized childcare, for instance. And because many of these nations have this, you know, family friendly generosity in their policies, uh, what ends up happening is mo many Nordic women are more likely to work as much as men do. And once they have children, uh, they are also more likely going to use all those wonderful benefits. So this is kind of the irony here, is that the high taxes necessary to maintain the family-friendly welfare state also encourages women to work fewer hours because high taxes reduce these quote-unquote opportunity costs and still get very similar uh, benefits, right, without working as much. So I mean, if I was a woman and I was a mother, I would totally do that too. Why would I go work 40 hours a week or 45 hours a week when I have kids at home? And if I stay home half the time, right, I can still get those benefits. Of course, I'm going to stay home. So I, well, that way I win in both sides, right? My career doesn't die and I still get to be present and connect and bond with my children, which is a very, very important job as well. In fact, I would argue more important than making money or having a career because you only raise your kids once. And there's always going to be jobs out there, right? Uh, and yes, you may not be in the workforce for five or 10 years and what have you, but that doesn't mean there's no way of ever, you know, sharpening your skills and, and getting back on track. I mean, the same thing's true for a man. If he worked 40 years of his life straight, but he never tuned up his knowledge or certificates or skills with the change of the time, he's also going to be 
uh, running a high risk of not keeping his job as well. So either way, you have to stay on top of your, your stuff, right? Whether you're a male or a female, that, that's the bottom line. So the result of the, of the studies is that, so even though the attempt here was a very strong one, um, again, these are all great steps to include the different talents and variation of intelligence and value that we all bring, right? Despite gender. Um, but it's fascinating that these studies, I mean, you, who would have guessed that these Nordic countries with that effort didn't get any closer to solving or discovering the truth about gender inequality and whether or not our roles or what we're more likely inclined to do um, is has nothing to do with biology or uh, is just because of some social construct that we've been conditioned to believe you have to like pink if you're a girl and, and be a teacher or a therapist rather than an engineer or a construction worker. I mean, so th that's the point here, right? Is that it's trying to show us that when you neutralize um, sociocultural stigma, as well as make sure that structurally in your policies, you make it easier for anybody to pursue anything they want, um, that you find that people are reflecting more of their fitra when you really think about it, right? Their natural disposition. This is a word in Arabic which means the natural disposition or the natural good or primordial state of the human being, you know, pre-social construction, by the way, right? So it's like that's what happened there. And of course, there's more to be uh, discussed about this study, but I just find that really fascinating. So in conclusion, one of the most powerful insights from this paradox study is that you can't really have equal opportunity and equal outcome at the same time. Why? Because the more egalitarian your society becomes, the more you increase how the differences of men and women actually manifest and are, which is going to determine their choices in career interest. Right? So you're only going to see how men are, say, more interested in things and objects. Right? This is why men generally are interested in things that are systematic, technology, engineering, STEM research, automobile industries, uh, construction working, etc., etc. And women are more interested in people and careers that have to do with people, therapy, human resources, education. Let's talk about homosexuality for a second. Is Even amongst most homosexual couples, there is still a masculine and feminine energy being played out. I mean, this is true. You have two men. There's one being done to and there's one that is doing, right? So there is this role or this idea of a masculine and feminine energy. And same with lesbian couples, right? So where does that come from if each person has already identified sexual arousal and behavior to be fulfilled with the same sex. So why are we still playing out masculine and feminine energies if that is associated with an opposite sex that I happen to um, not sexually be aroused to, right? I mean, let's think about this for a second. You know, there are experiences and objects that are used um, by both homosexual couples to enhance and fulfill their sexual activities. And some of these things require uh, addressing the very fact that biologically things aren't in sync, right? If a lesbian wants to penetrate her lover, she will use either her hand or an object that represents a male uh, private part. And men, when they sleep with each other, they need to use extensive amounts of lubrication to penetrate because that area does not naturally lubricate and is not designed for penetration. So we're making all kinds of adjustments and accommodations from surgeries, biological uh, and hormonal uptakes and changes if we're transgender. If we're homosexual, we're still using objects and, and items that will somehow recreate what is more so a heterosexual experience. Not all the time, but this still happens, right? And we also have to ask ourselves as a Muslim community, especially those of us who are, we have no room to think further about this stuff. We've already decided like this is all true and there's nothing really to question here. Okay, so that means, like Martina was mentioning in the article, that one day, if Ahmed, who in the last five years has identified as Amina, 
and has taken some hormone, uh, you know, to reduce his testosterone or even surgery or not have surgery. And one day you are going to be, you know, the person approaches you and says, hey, you want to marry this sister? Her name is Amina. And you find out that it's actually was Ahmed or he used to be Ahmed. And you said, no, I, I don't want to marry Amina because I don't feel comfortable or I don't really see that person as an actual woman. You can be considered now transphobic. And maybe one day that person can sue you because you don't consider them a real woman. That's, that's going to be a problem, right? Um, or if I identify as, a, as a Karima and I'm like, from now on, I'm going to pray with the women when I go to the masjid. And you guys have to accept that because I actually identify as a woman. This is a realization that I've discovered. And because society allows me to affirm this and I have protection from policies and government, to be a woman, I you can't have a problem with me standing now in between the, all of you in the women's roles to pray. Or a woman who says, I identify as a man and I should lead the prayer and all the men have to stand behind her and watch her lead the prayer. You know, my point is, is like, this is going to impact so many aspects of our society, religious communities, medicine, legal, education, it's not that simple to just say it's all about love and it's all about this. Now, I understand that, of course, from the LGBTQ perspective, as well as, you know, supporters of this, the ultimate goal is inclusivity, tolerance, love, acceptance of everybody. Um, and, you know, we want to reduce harm in society and help people who are usually alienated or isolated adjust to their societies and have a chance at a functioning and fulfilling life. I think that's a wonderful principle and I totally agree with that. However, that tolerance and acceptance and inclusion of everybody has to go both ways, right? And so instead of putting all our energy in denying, let's say our own values, religious values, personal values, scientific truths or data, then is that really tolerance? Like, is it tolerance if a Muslim says, look, I support your rights as an LGBTQ, but I also want you to support my right to say, I actually don't find homosexuality or LGBTQ to be morally appropriate, given the values of my community or my worldview, can you still hold space for that? Because that's not happening. The only time they hold space for Muslims is when we ignore our own religion and Quran and Sunnah, right? That's when you're now part of this movement. And this is why you have, you know, Muslim authors or speakers that come out and say, you know, this is all fine. It, because the only way you can have that tolerance and acceptance and and uh, inclusion is if you deny your own very religious values or principles. Right? So we have to water all that down, be like, oh, this isn't really what it means, or this isn't really what Islam says, or Islam in the end of the day just lets you do whatever you want to. It's like, what? Well, then what is it? What are we talking about then? That's not Islam. That's just whatever I want it to be, right? So what's up with that when we're not being really included or honored for our position as human beings, right? No matter who we are. That's not a red flag for people. I mean, when you really think about it, that's not a red flag. You know, um, do we, are we just kind of taking it without deeper inquiry or, you know, reflection or questioning? And if we do, we are now put in some category of being phobic or racist or whatever. And that to me is really scary because you can't even be honest about how you feel. You can't really pursue truth in the same way. You can't even use science in the same way. And a lot of these institutions, private institutions that influence the human, social, and behavioral human sciences are influenced by this politics. So that means that they are going to define for us what it means to be human, what's healthy and not healthy, what is sexuality, what is love, what is male and female or not. And this is going to dictate a lot of things in our social world, isn't it? In our religious world. Um, so to review, biology is not completely separate from gender. Um, if gender is completely separate from biology, then how come people who identify with a different gender undergo biological changes as well as social constructed quality 
qualitative traits, they transform that in themselves as well. If there's no gender, what exactly are you flowing away from and into if there is no such thing as gender and biology has nothing to do with it, right? Two is how does this impact policies in public, medical spaces, academic, educational, social, legal, where, and where, where is it going to stop? You know, can I identify with a different age or a different species? Can I identify with a creature that, you know, an extraterrestrial creature? I, I mean, what, where are we going to go with this? As long as you open the door, that subjective qualitative identification is all that matters, even though that's not the case with anything else in psychology and psychiatry. But when it comes to this, it's just all about affirmation. Right. And what's fascinating is today in many, um, you know, states in the United in the United States of America, licensed clinical therapists uh, are forced to do affirmative therapy. And again, when it comes to the regulations or guidelines of uh, these institutions, although there's a lot of benefit and need for it, uh, it's very interesting that when it comes to everything else, the patient is allowed to determine their goals in their course of treatment, except when it comes to homosexuality and uh, gender identity is coming uh, behind as well. In other words, if a person comes to you and says, I would like to cultivate or flow towards heterosexuality, legally, as a licensed clinician, you can't do that. You will lose your license. So is that tolerance? Is that science? Is that you know, are we actually flowing, you know, enough to allow people to also say, I would actually like not to be homosexual, or I'd like to just explore where homosexuality um, is in me. Thank you so much for tuning in. And, um, you know, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody who's going through a, a difficulty or a challenge. You know, we all have to hold space for each other. But I also believe we have to hold space in each other in a way that allows us to discover more truth and compassionately work with one another. Uh, I also want to make clear that I don't believe uh, people of different backgrounds or identifications should be turned away or harmed. They should be provided care uh, and help no matter what. But it's also very concerning when there is no room for other than just one thing. Thanks again for tuning in to the Coffee with Kareem podcast. Don't forget to support us at patreon.com slash coffee with Kareem. Get access to myself, exclusive content never released before, videos of future shows with guests. Please leave us a review on iTunes today and support the show. And visit coffeewithkareem.com to stay up to date with the latest news. Have a lovely day. Thank you.